And good afternoon and welcome to the Pride edition of Lambda Weekly. Uh, Patty just reminded me, she said, oh, that's a great Pride show we have today. Uh, murder. Yeah. Nothing better than LGBTQ issues in the criminal justice system. Sure, sure. But you know our guests, they've been here before. Richard Ray, you know him from Channel 4 News. And Scott Pogancy, you know him from American Justice, and Brandon Woodruff. Yep, American yeah. Justice Podcast. And you and American Justice Podcast. And you mm -hmm. don't know him from the 2020 uh, <laughs> special, not special, but uh, the episode that the episode. was about uh, Brandon uh, Woodruff's Hey, case. I was on there for five seconds. You so. were. You were in front of the Capitol. Uh, in, in case you missed him, he was the person in front of the Capitol turning in signatures. That's right. Um, we were all excited about the 2020 episode because it brought attention to the case that we've been talking about here on Lambda Weekly for years now. Years. years. Yeah. Yeah, it has to be at least four years because we were talking about it a couple of years at the old studio and that's yep. that was in 2019 that it blew away. Yep. Um, what did you think of it? <laughs> okay, let me start. I was horrified. <laughs> well, you know, I, I will say that um, it's, it's a little bit better the more that I think about it. When I first saw it, I was kind of like, man, they left so much out. But then when you start really kind of thinking about it and it, it just, it's good that it brought the discussion to a national audience, right? So we've been doing, we've been blasting their, you know, their Facebook page and their YouTube page and with, you know, links to the American Justice podcast and basically saying, if you want to know the whole story, you want to know the real story, like you want to know all the stuff that ABC didn't tell you, go to the American Justice podcast. And so we've been getting a lot of listeners. Our, our listenership is going up and up and up. So yeah, we're pretty happy that we got at least got it on the national stage so that we can come in behind and tell the whole story. I had been warning Scott before this happened that this, they're likely to make it very much a, uh, a mystery. He, maybe he did it, maybe he didn't. Right. I mean, that's the whole way they were gonna put this thing together. And that's what, in fact, what they did. I don't think there's any doubt at all that the main producer on this show is absolutely convinced that Brandon is innocent. In fact, as I told Scott repeatedly beforehand, there would be no reason to do this story on 2020 unless there was serious doubt about his guilt and the very probability that he is a wrongfully convicted man. I look at it a little differently. I, I was, you know, I'm kind of seething through the first 45 minutes of it because they're leaving stuff out. They're not balancing stuff that should have been balanced. They left out the Sixth Amendment violation where the lawyers for the prosecution were actually listening to his call with his legal team. How do you leave that out? That's, that's huge to the story. But the last 10, 15 minutes, they raised so many questions about his, his guilt. And I think if you look at online, and Scott checks his stuff more than I do, I think a good 70, 80 percent of the people who are commenting are convinced that from what they saw, my wife included, he's innocent. This is crazy. Well, I couldn't yeah. believe we got that far into the story without them even beginning to tell the other side. I mean, it's like, I'm like, they have 13 minutes or something. You know, I'm like, oh right. my God, this is, I they're going to cram was, it in at the I, end. I thought the show was one hour and it was like, they can't be ending it here. Oh, okay, it's two hours. <laughs> because at the end of one hour, they hadn't even mentioned that he was gay. Right. And that's what the prosecution based its case on. And the title right. of, the, of the whole episode yeah, was that's the this thing. double life stuff. And I'm like, oh, stop. Yeah, that's it really the fit the whole prosecution theme. You know, if he can lie about being gay, he can lie about killing his parents, which is so outrageous when you think about it. But yeah, the title to the show kind of played into that. But you know, like I remember in a, in a documentary, Sheila Kuehl, you may not remember her, she was on... Um, Dobie Gillis. Dobie Gillis, and ultimately became like like um, a, a state senator in California. She became and, speaker of the California Senate. And, and you know, very accomplished, well-respected um, um, politician. And she, she re told the story about, somebody told her, oh, well, if you can be honest about being gay, then I... I can trust you on everything. You know, you're going to be honest about everything. I mean, it's that kind of black and white sweeping thing. If he lied about being gay, well, guess what? We're in Texas, and he was in East Texas. In 2005. And going to know? Abilene and, Christian. Right. And go, Yes. He right. would have been thrown out of the school if he just mentioned that he thought he might be possibly gay. 
there's right. a lot of contours around that whole. Uh, well, being the gay other thing, thing. Uh, is they said he lied about being gay. Right. What is lying about being gay? Just leading your life and not every two minutes saying, keeping, oh, and by the way, I'm gay? Keeping your private life private. But here's the other thing is Brandon actually told the Texas Ranger when he was doing his interview, I went to S4. It's not his fault that Ranger Collins doesn't know that S4 is a gay club. Mm -hmm. So he was not lying about it. Not one time in all of his interactions did Ranger Collins ever ask him, are you gay? Yet he turns around and he talks to people like Alex Ruley, for example, and says things like, well, he's telling us that he's straight and that he has a girlfriend. Well, you know what? There's a lot of gay people that have girl, or gay guys that have girlfriends when they're not sure what they want. Or maybe they're just bisexual and, and they have a girlfriend and a boyfriend. You know, so he's not lying to you, but he's, but Ranger Collins turns around and tells witnesses that he's talking to, that he's interviewing, Brandon's telling us he's straight. And then he turns right back around and disingenuously says, well, we don't care if he's gay or not. But then they sit there and say, but he is lying to us about it. And if he can lie about something small, like being gay, then he can lie about killing his parents. And that was one of the biggest exceptions that I took was, you know, yeah, to you, a, a straight heterosexual male that grew up in, you know, rural Texas, maybe your sexuality wasn't a big thing to you. But to a gay person that is struggling and trying to really not only, A, figure out who they are and what they want, but then sit there and think about how do I tell other people about that? Like, that's a huge deal. And for him to trivialize it like that just absolutely was abhorrent. We did an interview this week for the documentary we're working on with uh, Allison Clayton with The Innocence Project, and it was really a powerful interview. And she talks about the fact that this is not how you do an investigation. The investigation has to center on the victims. Who were the victims? What was going on in their lives? Instead, we know virtually nothing about Dennis and Norma uh, Woodruff. All, we, all the investigation centered on was trying to catch Brandon in lies and to character assassinate him. Uh, she talked, uh, they, she's gonna be a powerful part of the documentary we're working on, which is another th reason we're here. We're promoting, we've got a screening. We've done three, four, five of these. Uh, we're gonna have another screening next Saturday, June 11th at the Texan Theater in Greenville. So go online, uh, brandon.org slash Free, free Brandon. Freebrandon.org slash tickets. And you, uh, and you can come see us. It's 6 o'clock. The theater's a beautiful venue. And, and yeah, I know it's Greenville, but it's only about a 50-mile drive from, from downtown and Dallas. It's a dinner theater, well so you can it. get dinner and you know, relax and all that stuff. And too. that documentary, that Rough Cut documentary, and it's different from any other one we've shown. We're continuing to build this piece, and it's got an interview. For example, for the first time, we interview somebody who was part of the investigation, current Sheriff Terry Jones who we actually had to ambush in a parking lot <laughs> to make this happen. It's a long, interesting story, but the, the new rough cut will tell that part of the story. But we'll answer questions in the documentary that people may have from watching the ABC 2020. And then afterwards, Scott and I are on stage. We, in these previous ones, they won't quit asking questions. We'll go an hour and a half and we finally have to cut them off. Right. But so come with your questions. And we're really, honestly, I'm not part of the LGBTQ community. You guys know that. But LGBTQA community well, okay. are allies. Well, I, I, get tr I get lost in the in the, in the <laughs> we, all we all do. We all do. But, but, I, but in my heart, I pray about this every day, that kids should not be in prison for this. And we really need support from the community. We need the right people to step forward and help us get this film made. We've got an excellent director with a track record for getting stuff on Amazon Prime and other big, uh, big platforms now. But we really need help. And if, if you're even at all interested in, come see the screening, see what you think about this documentary, and I think we'll get some people who. One want of the help. things that we uh, that when we did the interview with Allison that she brought up that I hadn't even really thought of, is how many gay youth are there out there that see what happened to Brandon? You know, they they villainize him for hiding his sexuality from certain people, his church friends, his school friends, people that he didn't think would understand. And they're, you know, they're 
assassinating his character because of it. How many gay youth are out there thinking, well, dang, if I can go to prison for the rest of my life because I'm gay, because I don't want to tell somebody that I'm gay, I better hide it you know, for much longer. Even deeper. Even, yeah, so exactly. So it, that's one of the reasons that we really feel like the community needs to come forward and stand up and say that, no, this is not right. This is not okay that you can prosecute somebody because he's lying, quote unquote, lying about his sexuality. When in truth, he's just keeping his private life private, which we all did. You know, I have the perfect example. Brian, my husband, uh, when he was in college, he first attended Dallas Baptist University. He was not out at all. He had a girlfriend at uh, Dallas Baptist, and he was called into a dean's office. Obviously, this dean had better gaydar than Brian did <laughs> because he was thrown out of the school for being gay, even though he, he was completely not out and, have, and he had a girlfriend. Wow. That's Ended up going to a better school, got a better degree. <laughs> <laughs> I think the world has changed a great deal, even in places like Greenville in the last 17 mm -hmm. years. It was a very different place 17 years ago. And when you think about that, the, the environment that that whole trial and, and the three and a half years it took to get to trial was just, uh, Brandon, the deck was so stacked against him that that you got, you begin to understand how it happened. It should never have happened. Now Greenville's almost a suburb of Dallas. <laughs> well, like there. Roy City, where the right. murders occurred uh, 17 years ago. And Scott has video of this even from uh, 2017. There's a house here and then maybe a quarter mile away there. Now there's subdivisions within a half a mile that have got hundreds of homes. It's become one of that new outer rim suburb kind of cities. At the time, it was a very rural place with a serious meth problem, which is another thing that the investigators never worked. They, they were, it, it wasn't a little county that never saw murders. It had murders, and a lot of them were involved with drugs. Again, the ranger, as far as we could tell, never looked at that possibility at all. They had right. they just purchased a foreclosed double wide. Lord knows what somebody left in the floorboards or something and came back to get. I mean, these are sort of things that I don't think that's what happened, but they never explored whether that could have been what happened. And, and I just realized, you know, um, over the last couple of weeks, we really started diving into the crime scene itself, right? We're looking at uh, the photos, the videos, everything about the crime scene. And we know a little bit because we hired a crime scene reconstructionist that was able to tell us a few things. But one of the things is we've really started to realize that the crime scene was staged after these people died. And I, even as much as I've been looking into the case uh, for the last, I mean, started doing the documentary in 2017, so that's when I really started studying the facts of it. I never really even realized, you know, there was, there's a couple of things. I'll just go through a real quick example. Like Dennis Woodruff is sitting there on the couch and he's got a, a tobacco spit cup in his left hand, just resting there. It's like, okay, well, that doesn't make sense, but it's just one coincidence, right? Oh, so, yeah, there's no tobacco in his yeah, mouth. Yeah, he didn't if have he's any been tobacco. Shot or whatever, he probably would have dropped it. Well, that's the, that's a, a, the exact case that Addison, Allison Clayton made. You know, if you're shot, you're not going to hold on to that spit cup, but he didn't have any tobacco in his mouth. Right. So, so there was had, no reason for him to even have a spit cup. So that was one thing. And then we started realizing, um, you know, that there were the condoms and pornography that were just thrown about the, the floor, you know, and we just, we started putting two and two and two together. And we realized that, that there's a very significant chance that this crime scene was staged after these two people died. And if that's the case, it would totally exonerate Brandon because as we've talked about in other episodes, his window of opportunity to even commit this crime with the best case scenario for the prosecution is only 14 minutes. So there's just so much stuff that he would have had to have done, you know, shoot and stab both of his parents, go to the bathroom, clean up, take a shower, uh, clean the clothes. bathroom, change his clothes, clean the bathroom so well that there was no DNA found in there. Make sure that the when he weapon. got out of, the, out of the house, there was no blood on his shoes because it was a bloody Very bloody scene. crime scene, right. And there was blood dripping all the way to the bathroom. So 
presumably there would have been blood in the bathroom before someone cleaned it up. So there was just literally no time for him to do this. And then add into, well, he propped his mom and dad up on the couch and put a spit cup in there and then put condoms all, like, it just doesn't make sense. And the 2020 uh, episode didn't even talk about the timeline, never mentioned it. Right. Well, they, they, they had Allison talk about it and, they, and she was saying that, well, there's about 19 minutes here as she was, uh, I don't think she studied the, the timeline as well as I did, but, um, but yeah, so they didn't really go over it though. That's what they, we wish that they would have spent a lot more time on it because the, the prosecutor in his closing arguments tried to argue that there was an hour that Brandon was unaccounted for from 9.30 to 10.30. And when I first started looking into this case, I was like, wait a second, I, I thought I saw some phone records that, you know, and, and I, so I started going back and piecing together every single call that Brandon made, every single call that other people made to him and started realizing, well, wait a second, unless you believe that Brandon's on the phone while he's murdering his parents, which is totally ridiculous. Well, since he supposedly had a gun in one hand and a knife yeah, in the other. What, what hands he got for the phone, right? He's stabbing with one hand, shooting with the other, and making a call with, I don't know, holding it yeah, between his ears. Speaker phone. Like, you know, <laughs> holding it between his ear and his shoulder. Right. But, uh, if you, but if, shooting and stabbing and doing... Yeah, it's like, or he puts the phone away. Hold on a second. I need to sh stab my parents real quick. I'll call you right back. You know, stuff like that. So if you look at the time that he's not making calls, then there's only 14 minutes that he would have to do all of this. And it's just absolutely, I mean, I don't think a trained assassin could do all that in 14 minutes. There's just so much, and one of the things that we go over in the documentary, if anyone would like to come out and see it, is we do go over the timeline pretty extensively and we show where the phone calls were and where he was and, you know, and all that stuff. And, and of course, they, did, they definitely didn't talk about the fact that the phone, rain, the phone calls that the ranger and the u.s marshal turned over to the court were not brandon's original phone records and this is one thing that just absolutely i don't understand how it's not a brady violation but basically all of the phone we had an expert that was able to go back and, and analyze the records now and he's able to say that every single phone record that was turned over to the court in this case from Michelle Lee to Charla Woodruff to Mike Etherington to Alex Ruley, all the extraneous people, they were the original phone records that were turned over to the court. Yet the phone records from Brandon were not authored by the phone company. They were authored by the U.S. Marshal's office. And so what they did, like a summary? Well, what this expert was able to say is basically they just imported into an Excel file and then there's no proof, you can't prove that they manipulated the calls because it's the, the file is authored by the U.S. Marshal's Office. However, what we can prove is that, it, that it's not the originals and it leads questions to, well, wait a second, why did you not turn over Brandon's original records? And with the kicker to that is Brandon's records just happen to have 14 hours missing from the day of the murder. So, and, but we know that he made calls because we have, for example, his girlfriend, Morgan Lee. We have a call from Brandon to her, or several calls from Brandon to her. We have his friend, Robert Martinez, that on his film bill shows Brandon called him. So we have all these calls, why are they missing? But the biggest kicker is, why did you not turn over the original records? And that is what is really. I mean, there's this thing called best evidence. Exactly, and yeah. Yeah, we go over that in the podcast, and that's... We need to take a break. Uh, this is Lambda Weekly. We're talking to Richard Ray and Scott Pogansey about the Brandon Woodruff case and how it was presented on a recent episode of 2020. We'll be back with more Lambda Weekly right after this. And this is David Taffet. I'm here in the studio with the late Patty Fink. Uh, Leron is in, at Fair Park in the parade. Um, Patty, He's priding. I, I saw... Um, <laughs> He's proud. I saw him yesterday at the festival, and he was there with Gabrielle, and I have not seen Gabrielle in, well, since before the pandemic. She has grown into absolutely a gorgeous oh, I'm young, sure. young lady. So, wow. Is she and, taller than him yet? Uh, about his height. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I'm not saying that while he's here, because I just 
just don't want to compliment it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to say that I'm really happy to see that uh, Patty Fink identified in the social media as the late Patty Fink. That was yep. a comment on her uh, tardiness or something because she's very much alive in here. Well, well she's, well, she's well, alive in here and she was on time, so I don't know. Well, we do have her funeral planned. It's scheduled for 11 and we'll roll in the coffin at 11.30. At 11 <laughs> you know, Wednesday when we were at the Dallas Police Department headquarters raising the pride flag, uh -huh. um, Megan. Um, Megan Thomas, the, the LGBT liaison for the department, like said in front of everybody that why I was why I was late why she moved me down in the program, and, and she expected you not to be there on time. What, but Chief Garcia said, you know, you saved me because that's his reputation too. <laughs> <laughs> or at least you know plan on eleven thirty, but then tell her eleven, right? We've so tried that. My, Patty, my the show starts that, at a quarter to one. My point is that Chief Garcia and I are you know compadres. Oh, nice. So. <laughs> We're talking about the Brandon Woodruff case, and uh, or as it was profiled on ABC's 2020. Um, when they called me, because producers from the show called me to ask me about you know what I knew about the case, and they had several questions. Uh, what convinced me that he's innocent? I said the timeline, the missing phone records. Um, the question about the uh, murder weapon, it's never been proven either one, either right. the knife or the, the guns. Right. They hardly talked about any of I those. I was going to say, so they didn't t touch on anything you talked about. <laughs> well, the other thing they didn't touch on that I talked about, I said, you know, I'm not sure you need to call Scott Pogancy about that. You know, I'm not sure you need to call Scott. <laughs> I, I'm not, you really need to call Scott on that one. He'll have the answer for yeah. you. And they didn't, did they? Oh yeah, they did. Oh yeah, they, they worked with Scott. Yeah, we worked with them um, uh, extensively, and you know that that was one of the things that we were pretty disappointed in, is because we've given them, you know, a lot of the stuff that was in the show we gave them, we we turned over to them, and so much of the stuff that shows Brandon's innocence, or at least shows the fact that he was railroaded and that he was not given a fair trial, they just didn't include. And, you know, I understand that because they're a news show, right? They're trying to get ratings. Uh, in fact, they actually ended up moving Brandon's uh, episode up because it was Sweeps Week. So they were trying to, they felt like it was going to be a high rated right, show. Right, that's what they sent me an email. Ooh, Brandon's show is going to be on this week. It's Sweeps Week. Right. Well, so, in fact, that's incredible that they got it on that fast. I don't mm -hmm. know how much we could talk about this, but there's another network in town right now that has interviewed Scott extensively. We're working with them just like we have with others in the past, and they're not going to get theirs on until late in the year, November, November or December. December. We yeah. can't talk about who they are yet, but it's it's a it's a show that very much is going to, I think, take a different tact on. ABC, for dramatic purposes, wanted to make this very much a mystery back and forth. And but I have to say over and over again that it's been such a blessing that they gave this story a national airing. It has. Our change.org page, for example, yeah. uh, tell people how to find that. It's change.org slash Brandon Woodruff. And it, it's gone up by tens of thousands of signatures. So yeah. it's opened this up, the, the, the major uh, Spanish language newspaper, El Diario, I think, in New York, has got a huge story on this. Yeah. All that, I think, came out of the ABC 2020 piece. So as frustrated as I know you are, David, and I know Scott was originally, I think he's tempered that some, it's been a real blessing. We well, really and the have. good thing about it is that when something does happen big in the case, you know, when Brandon files his writ of habeas corpus, or, you know, something happens in the case, there's going to be so many people that are, that are going to be like, oh yeah, I remember that. I saw it in the newspaper, or I saw it on ABC, or I saw it wherever. Whereas if we didn't have that national attention, then if something big happened, they wouldn't have that. You know? There's other networks that we've worked with in the past that didn't quite pull the trigger like ABC 2020 did, but they've told us too, yeah, we want it, when something happens on this, we want to know about it. So it, there's a real good chance that this thing could could blow up further. We, I pray about it every day, I hope it right. does. Plus the documentary that we're working on, you know, when we get that thing made, it, it will also have, you know, we'll show, we're not trying to hide the truth, right? So we will show anything that shows that Brandon uh, may have been hiding things or whatever, but 
the difference between us and ABC is we're going to also show the explanation for that, which is like, for example, the bag, right? That, uh, that Brandon was freaking out about because when they were coming back from the club, his couple of his friends, Alex and James were in the back while Brandon was driving and they were going through his personal overnight bag. And Brandon started freaking out like, hey, put it down. Like he almost pulled over the truck because he was so mad that they were pulling it over, that they were uh, going through it. And ABC didn't really talk about it, but the reason for that is because he had some gay pornography in there. And the guy that was in, uh, his friend that came with him from Abilene Christian University, Robert Martinez, was in the truck with him. And if, they, if it would have been confirmed that Brandon was gay, then, and Robert told anybody, he'd be thrown out of college. So there's, but the, the prosecution takes things like that and they say, oh, well, obviously there's the murder weapon inside that bag. That's why Brandon doesn't want anyone to see it. But then they ended up, the Rangers ended up seizing the bag, doing a DNA test on it. And of course there was no DNA in it whatsoever. Um, I can kind of relate to that um, as a, a gay <laughs> woman going to Baylor University. Right, and, right. You know, Jerusalem on the Brazos. <laughs> Um, and I know, I know what that's like being gay in that environment. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and, and if somebody finds out about it and you're, you're you know, petrified that, some, that they're going to tell somebody. Mm -hmm. um, I thought the most powerful part of the show, though, was when they interviewed Brandon. Yes, I thought absolutely. he did a good job of defending himself, yep. uh, looking honest, as yeah. honest as you can look through double-pane windows. Right. In a well, prison. they made him cry. <laughs> and uh, r r all the promo stuff they had, he looks just terrible because his eyes are red mm -hmm. and swollen and puffy and everything. I didn't really like that too much, but again. Yeah. Uh, oh, I thought that made him yeah. human. He's yeah. been in prison for how long now? Since yeah, 2000? Seven, almost 17 years. Yeah. yeah. So I, I agree. I mean, just you can just tell by looking at him, by watching him when he talks, that he is not the kind of person that would commit a crime like this, number one. But number two, when he's talking and things that he's saying and his facial expressions and his, you know, just his, the way that he conveys things, you, it's obvious that he's telling the truth. Um, I thought the one that made the worst presentation was his sister, Sharla. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is important to note. Uh, Sharla and Ranger Collins and the Smith County deputy were not interviewed recently. This comes from how many years ago, Scott? It was a Discovery uh, Channel documentary that uh, t totally took the Ranger side on it. They did an interview for that show. It was like 10 years, almost 10 years ago. 10 years ago. Since that show, Charla and the Ranger have refused to talk to anybody about this case, at least on the record. Right, so those, those clips that they showed of, of Noel Martin, uh, Linda Matthews, Brandon's aunt, Noel Martin, Noel Martin was the Smith County investigator, uh, and Ranger Collins and Charla, they're all from that show, so, so they, they refused to talk. Yeah, stock I guess footage, basically. Stock footage, right basically, yeah. Well, and they had to play, pay a licensing fee, licensing fee for it, uh, and which we could do for our documentary, but I doubt we'll do that. Yeah. Well, if Charlotte wants to talk to us, she knows how to get a hold of us. Um, oh, yeah. I thought what made her look the worst was she hadn't been to the prison to visit her brother in all this time. Well, this goes back to, you know, the day after, or two days after Brandon was arrested. Charlotte came down to do her second interview with the ranger. And she went down to the jail, which is right there in the sheriff's office that, where they did the interviews. She went down to talk to Brandon and she confronted him and was like, Brandon, are you gay? Are you gay? Tell me if you're gay. There's, there's guys all over your MySpace page. Tell me, you know, all this. And Brandon refused to give in to her. And she, she just got it in her head right then. Well, if he's lying to me about being gay, then he's lying about the big stuff. So if you look at it, if, if you look at the timeline, the very first person to say any of that about if you can be gay, you can lie about killing your parents is Charla in that interview. It's not until subsequent interviews that Ranger Collins starts repeating that mantra. And they repeated it throughout the trial. They tried to say that the, his sexuality had no, no, no part of this case. In closing arguments, they were making that whole argument that he's leading this double life and that his two worlds are about to collide, it was the basis of their entire case. Because they had no proof. You know, I don't, I don't know these people at all, but in watching it, 
um, it struck me when she was saying this that she, she, she makes the comment to the officer or something like, and I don't care if he's gay or not. I wanted to know. I went, well, that's, did you say that to him right. when you were asking him? Right. Like, I mean, if, if it were a sibling of mine, a, a really a close sibling, and it was just the two of them, yeah. it's like, why, why wouldn't you be compassionate about it? And this is actually one of the things that really irked me about this ABC show is, you know, that we worked with them. Richard and I both worked with them extensively throughout their production of this. And we asked them, like, are you going to talk to us? Are you going to interview us? And the whole time they were saying, yeah, 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 because you know the case better than anybody. And then when we heard it was coming out, we were like, wait a second, they haven't interviewed us yet. And so I called the guy and he said, well, ABC decided that they didn't want to feature your podcast because you went into Charla's medical records. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. Like Charla's medical records are the basis and the foundation for understanding why she is the way that she is, why she hated her dad so much, why she does all the things that she's done. And you know, the, the Noel, uh, Noel Martin, the Smith County prosecutor in that old show on Discovery, he says that, that this had to have been a very personal crime and the person that committed it had an issue with Dennis Woodruff. The only person in this whole scenario that has an issue with Dennis Woodruff is Charla. So why was she not, you know, I believe he's 100% correct. Whoever did this had an issue with Dennis. Why was she not looked at? And, and the, for ABC to come back and say, well, we didn't want to show the podcast, because you went into Charla's medical records is just, you know, it's her records, they're court documents. It's not like I went and stole them off of a doctor's desk. Like these are public records. Anybody listening to us right now can request these and they can hear all about them. Or they could just listen to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> or come to the screening or next Saturday. Screening. Six, yeah. six where, where is it? <laughs> it's in Greenville at the Texan Theater and it's uh, 6 p.m. next Saturday night, June 11th. And it is, and also there's an opportunity to have a private dinner with uh, Richard and I at five o'clock. Surprisingly, and, uh, some people are actually bought that. Some people actually bought them, but it, you can go to freebrandon.org slash tickets. And the reason you're doing this out in Greenville is because that's the county seat of the county where this case took where place. Where it happened, yeah. Well, and a shout out to the uh, owner of the Greenville Theater, too. It's a beautiful theater. It's uh, restored from the 1940s or 1950s. They made it into kind of a dinner theater. And Barbara, who owns it, has been wonderful, too. She's allowed us to use the theater without charge. And, and she believes and she supports Brandon. She's a big Brandon supporter too. So yeah. Barbara, you're wonderful. We love you. Yeah, the Texan Theater in Greenville, if you're listening, I don't know how far this goes out, but if you're listening in Greenville, of course it's on the internet, so they could be listening all over the world. But if you're in Greenville, go have lunch, go have dinner, go buy tickets. The Texan Theater is amazing. And you can eat that night too. Come early. And, yes. And, and they have a spaghetti dinner uh, special. Right, and it is important. <laughs> it is important that people in the hometown of the case are the ones that are actually calling for this case to be reopened. You know, we can say that here in Dallas. We could go to our district attorney, and he might agree with us completely, but he has no say. You can't just change a venue right. once a case is closed. Right, but we have been told by Brandon's attorney that, you know, this is one of those... Uh, sidetrack things that happens in this case, it turns out that the district attorney, the assistant district attorney that violated Brandon's constitutional rights by listening to his phone calls with his attorney is now the judge in that very court. The judge in that court. Right. Oh, you're Ke kidding. No, Kelly, Kelly Aiken. Aiken. Yeah, so, so normally the way that it goes back, whenever you file a writ of habeas corpus, it goes back to the trial court and you have to listen with the trial judge. Well, the trial judge is retired, but the judge now is the one that violated his constitutional rights. So he, she will be recused 100% without any, any question. The question then becomes, who takes over and who listens to it now? Well, we've been told by Brandon's attorney that he has some pull and that he'll probably, hopefully, bring in a judge from Dallas County. 
So we're hoping, crossing fingers, that that happens. And as we get more people looking at this, more eyes looking at this, uh, for example, we got, uh, Scott got a call a couple days ago from one of the producers who's working on the second uh, network show, and they found something very suspicious about the shot in the crime scene video. Yeah. I don't know how much we can get into that. I don't think that, we can go into that, but, 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 but there, yeah, very suspicious. There are more eyes being put on this by people who are looking at it critically, and they're going, wait a minute, that doesn't look right. So if, fingers crossed, uh, prayer said, uh, this thing is moving forward. Um, we need to take a break in a minute, but one of the pieces of evidence that they don't have is any blood in the car that Brandon drove away, the truck. Uh, I don't care how well you cleaned yourself up, there would have been on the bottom of his shoe. Absolutely. To, that was the way to get out of that house. Uh, there would have been some blood that they would have found in the truck, and they were looking for it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they, they sent it to the FBI crime lab. One of the things that was mentioned uh, by Sharla in the uh, 2020 video was that, um, okay, <laughs> the Alzheimer's <laughs> just kicked in. <laughs> Was it, it has to do with the, uh, the yeah. DNA or the blood or anything like oh, that? Oh, the, the, the truck. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, she God, She made the a truck. big point that nobody, <laughs> that that was her mother's truck and she would never have lent it but to But she's Brandon, the right? only one that I've ever heard say that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Everyone that actually knew the family, because Charla had been away at college for almost two years at this point. So the, the people that knew the family at that time, the next door neighbor, uh, some of the family members that talked to Dennis and Norma often, uh, Brandon himself, all, the, all these people knew that Brandon drove that truck a lot. In fact, one of the things that, point, well, there's two things that really point to it that are objective, that you don't even have to worry about opinion, is number one, Brandon got a, a speeding ticket in that truck. So he's obviously driving it at some point, but the other thing is, the only people that are on the insurance for that truck is Dennis, Norma, and Brandon. Oh, so he's even on the insurance? He's on, on the, the insurance. insurance. Again, uh, it, that's the sort of thing that for dramatic purposes, ABC wanted to make it look like, yeah, he could have done it. But if you really look at that, Charla's the only one that's saying, oh no, mom would have never allowed him to drive that truck. You know, even somebody who, you know, it, I use my truck all the time, I use my car, whatever, it was late Sunday night, he had to get back to school, and he'd be back that weekend. So the truck would have been gone a few days and... Well, that's the thing that, that, that a lot back. of people don't understand is, is Norma had, this truck was additional. She had a car, Dennis had a car, that's what they used to go back and, and forth to work. So the only thing that that truck was doing, it was, it was sitting in front of the horse trailer at the Heath house that was basically presenting, preventing the trailer from being stolen. So the truck would just sit there all week long. And Brandon's truck, he had a Dodge Ram that was older and it was breaking down. In fact, Dennis had to go to Oklahoma one time to come rescue him because it broke down. And they were planning on buying Brandon a new car, a new truck the next weekend. So they told him, yeah, just take the good truck back to college bring it back next weekend and we're gonna get you something else. So for ABC or any program to make, and the prosecutors themselves, to make such a big deal about that truck, it's just, it obviously shows that they don't have anything else and they're just trying to throw spaghetti at the wall and hope it sticks. We need to take a break. You're listening to Lambda Weekly on 89.3 KNO and FM. Patty, you'll open. <laughs> and Pat, Patty, take it away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're listening to Lambda Weekly, and this is the late Patty Fink um, in the studio <laughs> with David Taffet and our guests um, talking about the, the Brandon Woodruff case. Um, so Scott and Ray, um, how, uh, Richard Ray, sorry. Um, I know I hate those people that have two first names. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what do I call you? <laughs> well, we were just talking about the truck, and I came away from watching this, this episode of 2020 with questions about the truck, but thank you for clarifying a lot of that. And we were just talking in the break about how he actually switched out the truck. He left his truck at the Heath property and, and took the truck from there. Right. Um, which makes perfect sense right. because that was on his way toward getting to school. Right. And that's, you know, and, and the unfortunate thing is obviously Dennis and Norma are not here, so they can't tell us this. 
So Brandon's the only one that can tell us that, you know, they told him to take that truck because he was supposed to be coming back the next weekend uh, to, to get an, a new vehicle. And so, you know, it, it, when sometimes when the only person whose version of the story you hear is the person that's being accused, it makes a lot of people not believe him. But the thing is, like he's, you know, if you think about everything in this case, Brandon has not once lied about anything. The only thing that they have, and, and we can talk about this a little bit if you want to, is, is the timeline. You know, Brandon just didn't, he was a 19 year old kid. He didn't pay attention to the clock. And they're questioning him about where he was a week ago. And he says, well, I know that I went to have dinner with my parents. I know that I went over to the Heath house and got ready to go to the club. I know I went and picked Robert up. I know we went to Alex's house to get ready. Then we went to S4, then we went back to Alex's house, and then I went to college, back to college with Robert. So he, every single thing that he did that night was independently verified and was correct. The only thing was Ranger Collins was trying to, you know, pin him down on a timeline. And part of the timeline that ABC gave was wrong because Correct. they talked to the neighbor who said, yeah, he was here at 10, 15 or whatever time they said. Right. And then they had somebody else say he was in North Dallas at 10, 30 or whatever right. in a time period that he couldn't have gotten there. It's really pretty simple when you look at it. There's no question whatsoever that his mother, Norma, was on the phone to her mother till somewhere around 9.20, 9.25, 9.30, somewhere in that area. Right. Brandon is making a series of calls at 9.40, 9.41, 9.46. Even before that, 9.15, 9.21. Well, nine... <laughs> a whole series of calls. Again, they didn't turn over Brandon's records. There's this missing 14 hours, but you can reconstruct that from other people's phone records. And that's why immediately the ranger had seized on this because he had a witness that lived across the street in Heath that said he'd seen Brandon. He was sure it was right after the 10 o'clock news started because that's when he goes to bed. He'd seen Brandon there. Well, that's really proves he couldn't have done it because all these phone calls being made, mom's alive at as late as 930. He's seen shortly after 10 o'clock in Heath. You can't even drive from Roy City to Heath in that amount of time. But it was that initial, we caught you in a lie, you must be lying. That's why the ranger seized on that, that one suspect. Brandon became his one and only suspect. Well, and there's two things about that. The first thing is, Brandon told the ranger several times in the interview, I don't know, I'm not sure, I can't give you an exact time. That's not somebody yet. who's lying. Right, exactly, and that's my point is how, you know, that's like if, if David, you were to call me up and say, hey man, I know I owe you some money, how much do I owe you? And I said, I don't know, it's like 50 bucks, I think. And you go back and look at the receipts and say, no, it's $49.50. You're trying to, you know, it's like, no, I told you up front. I don't remember, I don't know, I'm just estimating. And that's all Brandon was doing was he was trying to estimate to the ranger to help him out. Like, let's get past this and go find the people that killed my parents. And if you look so, at the other phone, the other young people that testified about where they were and what they were doing, they're all off by hours. hours yeah. no, and that's, none of those kids knew where they, they could tell him I mean, they said one thing and then it turns out the phone records show that they were off by an hour. Well, and that's the other thing about that. The, other, the second point I was going to make is that, you know, Brandon, he didn't know. They, the, his family had told him prior to the interview, Ranger Collins and, you know, the Joel Gibson or uh, Terry Jones are going to be looking at you probably because you're the last person to see mom and dad alive. And he's like, okay, that's not a problem. I don't have a problem with that. So he starts trying to pinpoint his own timeline, right? He's trying to figure out where he was that night because he knows that they're going to ask. So he can't really figure out exact time. So he actually called Robert and was like, hey, what time did I pick you up at Denny's? Because I'm trying to, you know, figure this out. And Robert told him it was around nine o'clock when in reality, it was actually around 11 o'clock. So Brandon's sitting there thinking when Ranger Collins is trying to pin him down to this timeline, even though he's telling him, I don't know, I can't give you an exact time. Ranger Collins is like, okay, well, you would have left at 8.30, that would have put you there by 9, da, da, da. And he's like, yeah, that sounds good, because he's thinking in the back of his head that Robert told me I was there at 9 o'clock. So, hey, it's all adding up, sounds good to me. And then 
Ranger Collins turns around, lowers the boom and says, no, you're lying to me because we have a witness that saw you between 10 and 11. And if you look at... But that was at the Heath house, not at the parents' house. Well, yeah, but that that's where he was saying that he would... like he. Ranger Collins accepted that he went to the Heath house. It was just a question of what time did he leave? And, you know, and that's the thing is, is Brandon sitting there saying, I don't know, I can't tell you, but if you're gonna say I was there for 30 minutes, I guess I'll agree with you because Robert says that I, you know, he didn't say this out loud, but he's thinking to himself, Robert says I was there at nine o'clock. Okay, sounds good But he good couldn't to me. do all those things in 30 minutes at the house. Well, and if you look at the phone records that they, we do have, he made a call from somewhere in Mesquite at like 1046. Yeah. Uh, he's on his way. I mean, all this stuff is in the records if you look at it. Yeah. But again, it's really important to keep in mind that Brandon said to them in that first interview, please check out my, you know, check the phone records, check with my friends, please check this out. They promised he would. Instead, the ranger went straight into another room and wrote the arrest affidavit and didn't even get the phone records until six months later. Let six that months? In. I thought we were scared you were going to say six hours. I'm like, <laughs> six, six months? months. Yeah. And, 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 and that becomes important because by that time, the phone, phone companies don't easily turn over these records. Even to ple- they, they'll drag their feet on this. And by six months, there's some of these phone records are starting to disappear. It's a wonder they got any records at all waiting that long. Wow. Yeah. And for, for Ranger Collins to, to promise him, I mean, you can see in the interview, Brandon is begging him, go talk to my friends, check the toll records, check my phone records, you'll see that I wasn't there. And they promised him, yes, we're going to do that. And as soon as Brandon walks out the door, Ranger Collins starts writing the arrest affidavit and they arrested him the next morning. So by the time they got the phone records, Brandon was already in jail for six months. So even if he realized, and that's one of the thing, that's one of the biggest reasons why these phone records that were turned over not being the authentic records is such a big deal because if Ranger Collins would have realized that Brandon was at the Heath house during that 941 call to his girlfriend, Morgan Lee, that would totally 100% objectively exonerate him. And that's what I believe personally, Ranger Collins realized that and he told the U.S. Marshal, we got to get, we got to find some way to get rid of these records. Wow. I can't say that that happened, but there's some, there's so much, so much bad stuff that happened in this case and so much objectively, there's no doubt about it. They listened, they called the jail and said, we want to hear all the recordings of Brandon's phone calls with his legal team. That is so egregious. It's unconstitutional. It is. They, the, the judge ruled that they violated the Sixth Amendment of the United States Constitution, a right to a fair trial, right? And, and uh, the, private and counsel right with your counsel. attorney. And the, uh, and the judge just basically said, well, the way I'm going to fix this is I'm just going to recuse the DA and appoint attorney general uh, special prosecutors. The problem with that is they used all of the investigation that the Hunt County Sheriff's Department and the Texas Rangers had done up to that point. It's not like the AG's office came in and did their own investigation. And who knows how that was, who who knows how that evidence, the, the investigation that they did was tainted by what they heard in the calls because you know i'm sure that they were hoping that brandon was going to talk to his lawyer and say hey man here's where you can find the murder weapon but what they really heard was trial strategy like when we call this witness this is what they're going to say when we call this witness this is what they're going to say it's like the dallas cowboys playing you know the the new york giants and the New York Giants already have the Dallas Cowboys playbook. Or more like the Astros, knowing the, <laughs> the signs of right. their opposing teams. Right, exactly. Which they got called out for. Yeah. I, I think this whole thing with listening to his phone calls was an uh, indication of how desperate they were. They had no case. Right. They literally had no case. You know, one of the things you said, Richard, at the beginning of the show was um, you don't just look at your suspects you look at the people who were killed and then you're, you look for a reason that they might have been right. killed. In fact, right. Allison Clayton, who did an interview with us earlier this week for our documentary, and she's the lead attorney from the Innocence Project of Texas, she made it very clear, and it was a point that I think gave us both chill bumps because we hadn't thought about this. 
to understand what happened, the best voices you have are Norma and Dennis Woodruff. What was going on in their lives? Why were their condoms found spread all over the floor? Why was this pornography there? Why was, why was this their huge pair of blue jeans that were 10 times too big for, why, were all, why was the spit cup in his hand after he'd been shot and there's no tobacco in his mouth? All these things would have been questions that it's, an investigator would want to know. Get the voice of the victims. That's the important voice in this case. And they, they give us nothing on the victims in this investigation. It's all on Brandon. Anything they could find that was derogatory toward Brandon was all they were interested in. And I think it's important to show that 72% of Ranger Collins' investigation took place after Brandon was arrested. And if you go back and you look at that report, every single thing in there is talking about Brandon. I talked to Michelle Lee, we talked about Brandon. I talked to Alex Ruley, we talked about Brandon. I talked, you know, all these people that he did this, these interviews with, every part of his investigation from that point forward has to do with Brandon Woodruff and what and and how he had an opportunity to commit this crime. Bonnie, who is uh, Brandon's grandmother and Dennis's mother, is what his Brandon's biggest supporter, and she makes the case they never even talked to her. There's all this stuff. There, there's a piece of property in Arkansas that the Woodruffs were selling, and I think it was a double wide trailer or something like that. And and there was a person, a woman, I think, who was living in the trailer that was very, very angry that they were selling this, and she was going to have to find somewhere else to live. As far as we can tell, they never explored that at all. There was some sort of dispute over a shed that had been built on the property. Again, never looked into that at all. What was going on in Dennis and Norma's life that would cause someone to want to murder them? We That's, don't know. And Allison Clayton called it um, victimology, right? It's basically look at the victims and see what's going on in their life, not look at your prime suspect and see what's going on in his life. It's just crazy. Right, it's not a matter of blame the victim, it's a matter of just what's going on in their right. life. Right, because what, just who, with who the condoms, they know? yeah, with the condoms out there, what if they were swingers? What if they were, you know, they hosted these, these parties and stuff, wouldn't that be someone that you'd want to talk to? Maybe something got out of hand, who knows? But when you don't look at the victim and, and their life and what's going on in, in their everyday dealings with people, how do you know if there's anyone else that has a motive to kill these people. I thought it was, I was still kind of rolling around in my head about the truck. It, it kind of cracks me up that, that okay, mom and dad are on the insurance and Brian is on the insurance, but not Charla. But why would you add a 19 year old kid? That's gotta be expensive. I mean, that's just gonna, you know what I mean? That's a smoking gun. <laughs> it, if, it if is. For somebody who's had teenagers on my insurance policy, yeah, that's a smoking gun. <laughs> it's like they did not do that lightly because it was gonna, yeah. It was going to crank the cost of that insurance to right. put him on there. So it wasn't like, oh, well, it's, it's a little thing. We'll just throw him on. We'll bundle. Right. And that's not how that works. <laughs> exactly. And that, a lot of people just don't look at the facts. They don't look at everything that went on. But, you know, we talk about all of that stuff in the documentary. And we really call out some of the people. Uh, like we have a little bit of a clip from we had a call with Mike Etherington, who is the one that a lot of people thought that he was involved in the crime. And Richard, when he first came onto the case uh, with with me, he actually called Mike out of the blue, and and Mike answered the phone. No, actually, he called and, back. He missed my call, which yeah, he, yeah. so he technically called me. Yeah, so he called he called back, <laughs> and uh, and and talked to Richard for almost an hour about this case, and he told us so many wild stories and stuff that is demonstrably false that you know it's just it doesn't make sense why are these people continuing 17 years later to lie about so much stuff in this case and for people who don't know Mike Etherington and Norma Etherington's role in this they're the ones that first called first anonymously called the police department to point the finger at Brandon and it got in the arrest warrant that Brandon had on his MySpace page that he hated his effing parents and he wanted them dead. That was false. It still got in the arrest affidavit, but that came from Mike 
Etherington. They showed that in in yes. the in the 2020 episode. Well, what they don't talk about in the 2020 episode is the arrest affidavit itself, which is 100% bogus to begin with because there is not one thing in that arrest affidavit that has anything to do with Brandon being at the crime scene when this crime took place. Not one thing. Scott, Richard, thank you so much for being here. Uh, <laughs> there is a screening of your uh, documentary next Saturday, June 11th, at the uh, Texan Theater in Greenville. Go to freebrandon.org slash tickets. If you would like to go and see it. <laughs> please come see us. And please come back again. Uh, thank you for having Hopefully it'll us. be some more new stuff uh, on uh, the case. For all of us here at Lambda Weekly, next week we have um, uh, the director of the Gay World Series, Gay Softball World Series. And, and happy Pride Month. <laughs> which is, which is yes, happy Pride Month, else. everybody.